find out how my game runs at over 120 frames per second. In this game devlog, I'm going to talk about a few ways I've optimized my game throughout this past year. Hello, this is Cassius, creator of Mile High Taxi, a game I'll be releasing to Steam soon. If you're new here, consider hitting that subscribe button. I'll add all the links mentioned throughout this video in the description below. Plus, stick around until the end for a sneak peek at my latest game videos so you can see the results of these optimizations and more. If you haven't already seen my previous Unity optimization video or game trailer, be sure to check those out as well. Let's get started. Today I'm going to talk about my optimizations. A few of these are pretty specific to my game, but the rest should be useful for game development in general. My hope is you can find something in here that might be relevant to your game. Even if some of these aren't direct one-to-one -one for your situation, maybe they'll spawn some ideas. I'm going to start off talking about how I implemented imposters in my game. Then I'm going to move on to faking at part 1 and 2, which is basically about adding visual fidelity to my game at a very low performance cost. Then I'm going to talk about audio clips, dynamic object pooling, and how I had to hack at the LOD system to get it to do what I need. Finally, we'll see the results of these optimization and my latest gameplay videos. In my last video, I wasn't using imposters because the system I had already built was more efficient for the specific needs during that phase of development. As things moved along, imposters started to make sense for some of the new stuff I was adding in, mostly my dynamic objects and some of the skywalks and taxi bays. To flesh out the game's environment, I chose to use imposters to represent vertically distant details. For example, here's a smashable sign prefab. If I zoom out, you'll see there are copies of that street sign both above and below. Those are imposters that help sell the game environment and can efficiently remain enabled all the time. Players never really get close enough to really notice just how low quality they are. I used the same strategy for skywalks and taxi bays as well. In fact, I even used it for the cars. Not only did this help keep things optimized, it also helped cut my world building time by nearly 65%. Okay, so this one is a bit of a hack, and the results aren't perfect. They're just good enough. I needed a very cheap way of adding traffic high above and below the player's field of action. So I created a new scene and added all the vehicles to it. I placed a camera above them and used Unity Recorder to snap an 8K image. Then in Blender, I modeled out a flat plane to align with the skyways, which are basically the roads in my game. Those mesh got dropped into Unity and arranged in a way that they covered most of the skyways in the game. Next, I created a transparent material with the cars on it lined up. Finally, I animated the UV channels of the mesh. Okay, so the end result here is a pretty crappy looking series of traffic loops that I can place far above and below the player. If you pay attention to them at all, you'll see just how bad they look. But I'm okay with it because it's basically background noise while playing. The entire thing takes up only a fraction of a millisecond, which I think makes it all worthwhile. No matter how much I tried, I couldn't find an efficient way of getting light mapping working within Unity. It always seems to blow my memory budget. I think it comes in at about 25 gigabytes in textures. Real-time lighting was also prohibited due to the performance impacts that it has. Instead, I just baked with light probes around the city to capture light. And then I implemented a very cheap shadowing system, which basically uses a material with a skyline silhouette on it that's cast over all the objects in the game. The shadows are definitely inaccurate. I mean, they're, they're way off. In reality, because of the heights of my buildings, the sun wouldn't even actually reach any of the gameplay area the entire setting would be in shadows. But putting shadows in added a lot of visual fidelity to the game, even if they are very inaccurate. If I remember correctly, it only took about 0.01 milliseconds of processing time per frame. The shadows get casted on all game objects, whether static or dynamic, to bring it all together. 
Implementing the shadow system brought a lot to the game and it was a huge win for me in terms of performance optimization. Having too many audio clips playing at the same time in Unity can be problematic. I often forget that audio itself needs to be optimized as well. And I'm not talking about choosing which audio format, although that's of course very important too. I'm talking about the number of audio clips playing at any given time. My current understanding is that the number of audio channels is dependent on the player's audio card, not Unity. So I've been trying to stick to about 16 channels or less. Take the car traffic for example. If I'm flying along with 15 other cars in the immediate vicinity, that would mean 15 audio clips playing vehicle sounds, plus all the other background sounds going on. Instead of playing them all, I reduce the audio clip count in two ways. One, I have a collision trigger with the camera, where my audio listener resides. If the car is beyond, say, 10 or 15 units distance away, I disable the audio source for the car altogether. If an audio clip is already playing, I wait until it's complete and then I disable it. The second way is that I pool clips to about five, meaning no more than five cars can be heard at any time. The same is true of most other object sound effects as well. For the pool, I created an array with a length of five that represents whether or not a car should emit sound when it's within audible distance. If any of the five array values are true, it gets switched to false and the audio clip is allowed to play. If none of the array values are true, the audio clip doesn't play. I also pooled the audio for dynamic objects. When the player goes smashing through a bunch of objects, each collision between the player and object, object on the ground or buildings, object and object, kick off an audio clip. Early on, that meant there could be over 100 audio clips playing simultaneously. That doesn't work or scale. So I created a pool of about 15 game objects for determining whether an audio clip should play for a collision or not. Each object also gets a short delay before it's allowed to try and make a sound again something like 0.2 seconds. I used a statically cached wait for seconds method to remove the garbage collection that gets caused by uncached wait for seconds yield methods. Besides the audio sounding cleaner, I was quite surprised at the frame rate increase during this part of my gameplay. I hadn't thought about the impact so many audio clips would have on the CPU with all that decompressing and playing all the time. But after reducing their numbers, it of course makes sense. I used a couple of different pooling setups depending on the type of game object it was for. Since some objects are only concerned with the physics engine, such as being hit and bouncing around, whereas others either got no physics at all or required manipulations to things like UV maps, I decided for now to keep those separate. My pooling setup may be a little unusual. Here you can see a prefab table set that contains a bunch of other prefabs within. Doing it this way allows me to pool each object type individually rather than the table set as a whole. These children and parent prefabs actually get destroyed on game startup and replaced with a static placeholder prefab. Right now it happens at startup, but I'll be moving that into a build step later on in development. The placeholder has two key components. The first is a sphere collider trigger and the second is a mesh without a material. The Sphere Collider is static and gets triggered by the player to supply the pooling system with information about the type of object it represents. It selects one from the pool if available and displays it on screen. I don't disable these game objects ever to reduce the performance impact that entails. Plus, you shouldn't ever disable a static object that has a rigid body and collider. But some components do get enabled or disabled depending on the object's state. The mesh renderer doesn't actually show anything, since there's no material and that means essentially no impact on performance. But it allows me to check if the object is visible to the camera when the player enters the sphere collision trigger. I just use a simple cube object scaled to the same size as the object that it represents. So overall how it works is I set up my scene and build up the environment with the dynamic game objects. Those ones that are built into the editor are not the final ones that end up in the game. At startup they get replaced by that static prefab that I mentioned a moment ago, 
I have a singleton that will instantiate the prefabs and keep them in a pool. Then when the player triggers the static prefab, it calls into the pool and displays a dynamic object. I already explained this in a previous video, but for a quick recap, I heavily segment each of my buildings so they can be tiled efficiently. What I've noticed is that the more active game objects, regardless of whether they're dynamic or static objects, the slower things start to run. Normally there's not enough game objects to be noticeable, but I have hundreds of thousands in Mile High Taxi. I needed a way to reduce the object count. To get around the problem, I originally built a system that would disable building game objects when the tower goes out of view. But as it turns out, enabling and disabling game objects is surprisingly expensive on performance, since Unity must traverse many of the components in the process. Since each building consists of at least 180 game objects, and during gameplay there could easily be 10 or more buildings going out of view or into view during any given frame, all that enabling and disabling of objects had a huge impact. To put that into perspective, the game had been running at about 180 frames per second, but when the player would turn, bringing new buildings into view and others out of view, it would drop down to about 30 frames per second, with nearly 100% of the CPU consumption going to enabling or disabling processes, even when every game object was placed at the root of the hierarchy. So instead, I focused on enhancing the way LODs generally operate. For example, originally each building segment's lowest quality LOD level would consist of four game objects, each with a flat plane. At 4 sides per building and about 15 vertical tiles, that's 60 game objects per building for the lowest quality LOD alone. To reduce the game object count for the lowest quality LODs, I created a new scene, dropped all the unique buildings in, and outputted them into a single 8K texture using Unity Recorder to use as a template. I went through the very painful process of matching my original textures up with the much lower quality version. The Albedo, Specularity, normal, and occlusion map all needed to be done for the material. In the end, I have a single material that accounts for every building iteration in the game at a very low quality, that could be used on a simple cube to represent the entire building at a distance. So rather than having 60 game objects per building for the low quality LOD, instead I have just one. To put this into perspective, that strategy saved me about 25,000 game objects. Because each of my building segments is so small, but the highest LOD level is so big, in fact it's the entire building, Unity's LOD bounding system kept trying to account for the size differences in strange ways. So I needed to force the LOD bounds to specific sizes. I've never done this before and hadn't realized it previously, but you can do this in the editor. Going into the inspector and into debug for the LOD group shows it, and you can then manually set the bounds you desire. That way, I could have a fairly small bounding box for the LOD that better represents the smaller mesh and the high quality LODs, and still allow the low quality LOD to be a member of the group. If you've made it this far into the video, you're awesome. Thank you for being awesome. Here are some of my latest gameplay videos from Mile High Taxi. I hope you enjoy them. Let me know in the comments below. Thanks! I'm gonna go next time I'm taking towers and get my life together. Animal! Ugh! Hack the planet! Hack the planet! I'm heading to Adelaide and Simcoe, level 625. Take my money. Woohoo! I'm still classified as human. I don't care what everyone says. Hey. Hey.